Welcome. We're honored today to have with us our executive director here at the museum, Chris Gurgany. Chris has been with us since June of last year, so a little over a year. And uh, Chris hails from Illinois, and his wife is Ruthie, who's sitting right here. And they have a son, uh, Griffin, who's 15, 14, 15. But you'll sometimes see Griffin around here, too. He's, he's as enamored with cars as his dad is. And Griffin just bought a 1953 Studebaker. So it's a, it's a, going to be a work in progress for a long time. I know Mom's excited about having it in her garage for the next 20 years. <laughs> Get used to it. You've got car guys. <laughs> anyway, Chris is uh, just an amazing, amazing car fan. He loves cars. Uh, he enjoys spending time around these cars as much as anything that I know of. And uh, uh, Chris is here. He's going to talk about our hot mobile today. And, and uh, Bless his heart, he kind of came into this unbeknownst that he was going to be doing this. The gentleman that was going to be doing it, unfortunately, he passed away earlier this year. And so Chris will tell you why this car is important to him and the family and how we got here to the museum. But uh, anyway, Chris, I'm going to turn it over to you, and we look forward to your presentation. Thanks. Don't go anywhere, Doug. <laughs> Am I fired? No, no, no. <laughs> Double enlistment again. We need to make sure we wish Doug and Elaine a happy 39th anniversary today. Oh. And we need to thank Elaine for putting up with the long, crazy hours and weird calls and emails and texts and Facebook messages and other assaults on their private time. So thank you for putting up with us. All right. As Doug said, this wasn't a talk I planned on doing, but when your planned on speaker and expert is no longer with us, you kind of have to do something. And because this car comes from my wife's family, we decided it was probably best if I say something about it. Ruthie, my wife there, her uncle bought this car in the early 90s. And we'll go into the restoration specs on it because they are off the charts. But he took it to a lot of shows. It's won a lot of awards all around the country. But we'll get more into that in a little bit. I had to choose kind of a strange title for this. Great cars can come from dysfunction. And I think by the time we're done discussing the Hup Mobile and the Hup Motor Car Company of Detroit in detail a little bit, you'll understand why I'm calling it Great Cars from Dysfunction. Hup Motor Company of Detroit was founded in 1908 by Robert Bobby Hup, Charles Hastings, formerly of Oldsmobile, William Drake, and Emil Nelson. Emil was from Olds and Packard, as they're among others. They worked to develop a new light car of their own. Now at the time, you had a couple different classes. You had a light car, which was lower cost, and then you had the more fancier, heavier, medium cars. They decided to call theirs the Hupmobile after Bobby Hupp. With initial capitalization between $3,500 and $8,500, they managed to make two prototypes. They got the prototypes together. They took it to the Detroit Auto Show in 1909 and revealed it and it was such a hit and the people were so excited about it and they were such good salespeople that they ended up leaving the show with 500 cars ordered. That's quite a lot. Henry Ford recalled saying when he was at the, that show, I, really, I recall looking at Bobby Hupp's Roadster in the first show where it was exhibited, Detroit Auto Show 1909, and wondering whether we could ever build as good a car for as little money. Bobby Hupp had worked for Ford from 06 to 08 on the six-cylinder K model. He worked with Don jo John Dodge, one of the Dodge brothers, on the project. So he had ins and outs with them. Plus some of his partners, once they get the company on the ground, were from Olds and other car companies as well. The biggest surprise of all, though, is 1909, the Hupmobile was $100 cheaper than the Ford Model T. 750 for the Hupp versus 850 for the, for the Ford. First car they produced was the Model 20. It started in 1909. By the end of the first year, the 500 pre-orders had turned into 1,618 cars manufactured. It was a four-cylinder, lightweight, two-seat runabout. In 1910, Hub decided to take and send three cars across country to the New York Grand Palace Car Show. 
turned out that it was a huge blizzard and nasty weather the whole way across. And remember, there are no interstates at this time. There aren't even any really highways. Gravel roads, some improved a little bit. They drove all the way from Detroit to New York. This, they all three made it. And this is what started Hupp's reputation for extremely reliable, inexpensive cars. This led to their next stunt, a race around the world. Now in 1908, there'd been a race from New York to Paris the long way around. Thomas Flyer did it in the fastest time. That was a much more expensive, much bigger car. This race ended up with them wanting to do their own, but with a different route. November 4th of 1910, let's start from Detroit in the end of fall, early winter. They managed to take a brand new, right off the line, 1911 Hupmobile Model 20 and expanded the wheelbase from 84 inches to 110 so they could put the first second row on their car. Up until this point, the first two years, they'd all been two-seaters. They nicknamed the car the Little Corporal. They sent a three-man team. Driver was Thomas Hanlon. He's a mechanic and top driver from Hupp. Joseph Drake was one of the financial backing founders of Hupmobile. And they took a former reporter named Tom Jones to photograph and act as the historian for the trip. They drove from Detroit to Chicago, and it took two days. They then, once they get to Chicago, cut across, as they referred to it, the roadless west to San Francisco. In Iowa, they broke a tie rod on the front end. Pulled over, fixed it, took off. San Francisco, they took ship to Hawaii, where they drove up Mount Kilauea and across the island to a ship. They sent them to Australia and the Philippines. Now, this isn't just around the world. This is all over the place. From there, they went to Japan. Now, Japan, they had the worst failure on the car they have the entire trip. They broke the steel axle. Now, Hanlon, the mechanic, looks over, sees a rickshaw, a person pulled taxi with a steel axle, and adapts it and puts it in the car to take off. The borrowed axle worked so well, they didn't replace it when the replacement parts caught up with them in China. And in fact, they didn't replace it in the trip. Once they were done in Japan, they went on to China, India, the Malay Peninsula, Dutch East Indies, Singapore, Rangoon, Burma, Calcutta, Bombay, Egypt, and Jerusalem. <sighs> when they got to Singapore, the Sultan of Singapore at that point had never seen, let alone been in a car. 1910, 1911. So they gave him a first ride in, in the first car that would have been through that part of the world. Once they finished up in the Middle East, they went on to Europe, starting with Rome, where they had a, an audience with the Pope. This was a huge deal. Newspapers covering it all over the place. Once they were done there, they went up through Paris and finally England and Ireland. Now that's a pretty epic journey. You know, we're done, let's put on a ship and take it back, right? Not exactly. They said around the world. They arrive in New York just in time for the 1912 New York Auto Show. In this battered, beat up, year and a half old, hulk of a car that's still running amazingly, but doesn't look real pretty, but they were the star of the show because they pulled up in that little hutmobile with a little four cylinder and they've gone around the world with a rickshaw axle. But they weren't done, so they decided they had to drive the toughest leg and the hardest leg of the journey. And this is in February. So, you know, they're not going past Florida, apparently. They decided to go back, including up into Canada, for the trip. And they finally reached Detroit. I don't know about you, but I don't think I'd have gone up into Canada we're across the northern route at that point, but they wanted to prove the car, right? This trip included 21 countries, 48,600 miles of driving, and another 25,000 miles by ship. Those two distances are three times around the world, because we're about 24, 25,000 miles at the middle. The car, and that is the car, exists now in Cleveland, Ohio, at the Crawford Auto and Aviation Collection. That's a tough little car. 
It's missing a few things. I don't see the, the hood and a few other things on it, but that is the car they took around the world. 1911 saw the release of the Model 32 or Model H, their first four passenger touring car. This included the beginning of the long stroke technology and engine building too. Up until this time, the thought was that short piston rods were the best because you got enough compression, but they started playing with longer and longer rod lengths. Basically for, with this, it was about was it three and three quarter to four and a quarter inches of stroke. They boosted it up about an inch to five and a quarter and realize, five and a half and realized they were getting more power. So at this point, they're turning to a new technology of long stroke and it's really giving them a good reputation. They also released a new design for engine oiling and lubrication. They're the only company to use this design. It worked and they used it for about 15 years, but they moved the flywheel to the back side of the motor. They encased the whole thing and the flywheel reciprocation caused enough pressure to pump through that not only would it oil the, lubricate the transmission, different parts of the engine, the front yoke suspension mount, it would also spray it in where it needed into the cylinders themselves with spray force. So very fiddly system, overly complicated, that's why it never caught on with anybody else, but they're using a new technology here. And it was also the first year an American car company used an all steel body. Up until that time, wood was heavily used in cars. Hupp was the second company in the world to go with an all steel body. BSA in England was the first. 1911 also saw Robert Hupp leave his namesake car company. He got into a fight with the other main voices, main financiers about what direction to take the car company. Robert Hupp was a, I guess, disciple almost of Ford. He wanted to produce, mass produce, cheap, inexpensive, reliable cars. That's what he's founded the company on. But the partners wanted to go more like Packard and have much nicer performance, very expensive, that only catered to the wealthy. And if we think back now, Packard's gone, Hupp's gone, Ford's still there. Now there's a lot of luck and some things in what Henry Ford's story is, and that's for another time. But he decides to do his own thing, so he goes out and starts the Robert C. Hupp Motor Car Company. Hupmobile sues him, and it turns ugly, and he loses the rights, so the judge allows him to use RCH, Robert C. Hupp, as the name of the company, but he cannot claim to have been the inventor of or anything to do with the Hupmobile. In fact, the company was legally allowed to come and seize his Model 20 runabout, which I believe was the first one in existence, and that's why they didn't want him to have it. So, a lot of back play and things. 1914, they introduced the Model K, 1916, the Model N, and 1917, the Model R. Now, before we get real far into this part of it, I'm going to tell you, I don't know why they chose those letters. Nobody had anything that I could find on the letter selection. They make no sense that I can figure out. And so if you've got an answer on that, I'd love to hear it because it's all over the place, as you're about to see. 1923, 24. About 1912, they'd had to increase their production floor to 55,000 square feet for their factory. That's the size of this museum. 1923 and 24, they had to build an all new factory at 1.57 million square feet. They'd added on to the old 55,000 by 100,000 here or there, but they were way under what they needed to build their cars the way they were being ordered. So that's a huge jump in a very short number of years. Hupmobile in 1925 also introduced the new straight eight cylinder design, their first eight cylinder, their first car that wasn't a four cylinder. This allowed the creation of the luxurious model E1. Now the E1 came out to such fanfare that Hupp had to put a ban on any release, anybody seeing the car at the dealerships until the release date. But apparently, and I know this will shock us in today's world, the dealers and the people there wanted to see it and would steal it and take it out at night and drive it on the country roads. And it was amazing. They, they just, everybody fell in love with this car. But the thing about it was it had these huge, very bright headlights, oval shaped, 
that made everybody think about the Cheshire Cat in Alice in Wonderland or Through the Looking Glass. And it got the nickname Cheshire Cat, and that's what it's still recognized as. But that's just a, a public nickname, nothing that the Hutmobile did themselves. But that was how big a hit they were at that point. 1928 is the height of production. They produced 65,862 cars. They'll never get near that again. When they were producing the eight cylinder inline, they also were simultaneously designing a very similar six cylinder inline, which they released the eight in 25, they released the six cylinder in 26. Now the car itself didn't change. It was just basically the motor at that point. They'd engineered the car not knowing which engine would be ready first, which would be the better to release, so that the two blocks were similar in size enough that they could use either one in it. So that was kind of an interesting point you don't usually think of on these cars. Engineering it so that it's got a bigger six and a little eight, and you can put both of them in the same body without making any major changes. Also, 1931, and this is a 31 here, ours is, saw the first American car with freewheeling as a standard option. Freewheeling is what we would call coasting. When you pushed in the clutch, it allowed you to, to keep the car moving for a while instead of it being drugged down by friction. That was a major step forward. Some of the real luxury cars apparently had that feature as an option for a lot of money, but Huff standardized it in 31. 32, new models and designations. The system now uses models S and B for six cylinder, models L, C, F, H, and U for eight cylinder models. Anybody figure out how those are related? <laughs> I, I, I really can't. Um, but in 32, they started with a new system that part of it makes sense. The letter doesn't make sense. It just tells you which body model or which frame model you're purchasing, chassis. But the model, S214, S being for the six cylinder, two being 1932 and 14, meaning it had a 114 inch wheelbase. So you could look at the name and know wheelbase, engine, and what year it was produced. And it changed every year thereafter. Now, this is one of the most interesting parts of the Hutmobile story. And we're talking about Archie Andrews, not, not this Archie Andrews, this one. Archie Andrews was a scoundrel, crook, and thief, period. He spent a lot of time making himself a lot of money. He started as a photographer's assistant for, I think it was 10 cents a week. He went from there to working in a number of places and finally became a stockbroker. With the stockbroker, he did pretty well but he did so well, in fact, he ended up with a seat on the New York Stock Exchange, several seats on the Chicago Board of Trade, and was making a lot of money for himself. Kind of had a few scandals where he was misappropriating money from his clients, um, making illegal trades, um, torpedoing corporations. So just to give you a little background on him, he became very, very enamored of a new prototype called the Ruxton. The Ruxton probably would have been the first front wheel drive car in America if it had gotten produced. It was before the L29 Cord came out in 1929 and this guy loved it. He tried to get it done, he invested in Ruxton and he comes to Hupp and says, will you build this car for us? And Hupmobile says, no, we don't have time, we got our own things going on, don't want to deal with it. You know, sorry, can't help you. So he goes out and buys a controlling share of the Moon Car Company out of St. Louis. Moon were a very high performance car in their day. My great grandfather had one. They're an amazing car that I'd love to see here sometime on loan or in the museum because they're very rare. They were state of the art for their day, very high performance. After he takes them over, he realizes their factory can't possibly produce the rucks that it's too small. So Moon's gone, poof. He invested in a company called the Kissel Motor Car Company. Took it over. By the time he was done, it was gone. He helped found New Era Motors to try and make this happen. And again, ran into the ground, pirated some money, 
He ends up getting arrested, taken to jail for, I think it's 15 years, for securities and exchange fraud and violations. He lost his seat on the New York Stock Exchange, obviously, and all that, but real character. Anyway, when he buys and gets control of about 34, 35 of, or 34 of HUP, he waits a little bit, builds himself up, builds more of his stock in, and votes himself in as chairman of the board at no salary. Then he goes ahead and appoints himself president at a salary in 34 of $3,000 a month. Wonder why the car companies start having financial problems? It was a mess. And he spent more time trying to get the Ruxton or the front wheel drive hub developed. It killed production. They fell behind. They didn't get the finances to continue buying parts to build the cars they already had sold. So there's a snowballing effect here. Finally, they've had enough. The board forces him out and the, the nasty legal battle and he goes to jail. 36 after he's gone, they're in such bad financial position, they managed to build 74 cars that year. From 66, 69,000 cars in 28 to 74 in 36. And they have to close the factory for a while because they don't have the money to buy parts. They get some additional financing and things. They restart production after 18 months in June of 37. That year they only produced 238 cars. Most of those were made out of leftover parts from previous models. Most of them were, exp and almost all of them were exported out of the country where HUP still had a good name. Because these legal battles, they went on about two years and ran HUP's reputation through the mud here. 39, HUP's desperate. They need a Hail Mary. They don't have the money for a lot of things, but they managed to scrape together yet another startup amount. I think it was about four million. They ended up buying Gordon Burig's designs for the cord, our cord right here, 810812 for nine hundred thousand dollars. That's a lot of money back then. Because of the costs of production, because they didn't have enough money to do it, they went out and partnered with the Graham Page Automobile Corporation, which was in similar financial trouble. So too bad in finances don't merge to make a great corporation. Then they never really merged. They both produced them separately. For HUP, they produced the Skylark. Before, before Buick took it over later, the Skylark was the HUP. And you can see the lines and things. And in the case of the HUP, if you look at that grill, the Lincoln Continental from the early, late 40s stole the ideas for their, for their grill off that car. Graham Page produced the Hollywood, a little more refined, a little higher cost, a little better production, to be honest about it. But both of them did away with a lot of the things that made the cord special. You know, there's no hidden retractable headlights. The suicide door stayed, no, no supercharger, it's not front wheel drive. Gordon Burig saw the Hutmobile version of his car and about wept over it. They shortened the wheelbase by about 10 inches. And because they were doing a standard rear wheel drive, that car has the first transmission shaft tunnel of any car in the US. They came out with the concept of the transmission tunnel. Unfortunately, it didn't allow them to lower the car down to the specs that Burig had designed it for. And he said it looks horrible. It was over an inch higher in the back and just threw the proportions and, and the, the lines of the car completely off. I think if I'd invented something and designed something that beautiful, I'd have probably wept too. Because of costs, when they partnered, both companies released their versions. Hupman made the Skylark in 39 and 40. There were a little over 300 cars total produced. And then the Graham Page made it for one more year. And that they ended up with, I think, around 1,200 models. Hup was out of the game by 40 as far as manufacturing cars. They went into World War II, they were making car parts, and, or before the war they were making war components for vehicles, after the war they made car parts and continued for a long time to do so, I think well into the 60s. But that's how Hutmobile continued on under, under different visions. Graham Page disappeared pretty quick too. Now, just to make 
things interesting. I went ahead and listed all the models I could identify from the few years that they were in business. You got two years with just the Model 20 runabout. Then you bring in the, the Model 32, Model H, which was the bigger, little nicer one. Then you start in through the teens. In the 20s, you start adding several different things. The, the E1, we talked about, and the Model A was what they called the six cylinder. Here, in 1917, the Model R, they started adding additional body types. With the Model K they came out with, they had a limo body as well as a sedan body. By 17, they'd added a five passenger Turing, five passenger sedan, Roadster, Coupe to the lines. By the time you start getting down into here, you have as many as six or seven different car chassis with up to 10 body types you can put on any of them. How do you produce at any level of, of competence and quality when you've got so many choices you can't tool up and make a big run of this model and this body? You know, they're, by 30, they're down to about 16,000 cars a year. And after that, it drops well under 10,000 a year for the rest of their history. Then you get into where it really starts getting crazy. The Model KK was the Model K, but they just didn't make it with all the amenities. It was a cheap down version of that. And then you went through year after year. Every year the, the number changed because of the way they were doing their designations now. Now, HUP did a lot of things for the automobile world. First all steel body, as I mentioned, first to develop freewheeling. They were the first to offer fresh air car heaters with the oven air conditioner. That just means that it would bring air through like a modern car, not air conditioning itself. That was later. But they had, they had the fresh air and the heated air coming into the compartment. The unique oil system, double brake system. Instead of going with cones and plates and things that they were doing early on their performance models, HUP came out with a double plate drum brake. It squeezed the inside and the outside of the, of the drum at the same time to give you better stopping. Manifold carburetor heater to improve vaporization. Zenith radiator that self-primed. Both those help you with winter starts, long sets, things like that. And then of course the drive shaft tunnel. Two things that came out of HUP. In 1914, Eric Wickman tried to establish a HUP mobile dealership, but he couldn't sell the cars. So he took one and started driving miners to and from town, and that turned into Greyhound bus lines. Also, the NFL, this is either a good fact or a bad fact, was created at Ralph Hayes HUP mobile deal dealership in Canton, Ohio in 1920. So if you're a football fan, that's a great thing. If you're not, probably not so good. This brings us to our HUP mobile. Doug alluded to the fact it's a family car. It was. My wife's, Ruthie's uncle had this car. He bought it early 90s and had it restored with meticulous detail. Um, this was the, the love of his life of cars. And he had a Pierce Arrow and he has a, had a Packard and he's had some nice cars, but this was the one that he would never sell. And fortunately, the family, after he passed a few years ago, as I was getting ready to come up here to start working, told me they needed to sell the car. So I got them and Doug in touch with each other and then got out of the way so I couldn't be blamed for anything. <laughs> he spent over 2,000 hours in restoration over six years on this car. He went to the crazy length of this paint was custom made. That's nitrocellulose based um, lacquer that he had a major company reproduce to the specs of, of the 1931. Every one of the pinstripes on here is hand pinstripe. I challenge you to find a variation off that 1 8 inch line and where they don't meet right because nobody's been able to find it yet. He had the, the pads for the running boards as well as the floor mats handmade in Australia. There's a huge Hutmobile collectors group in Australia. In fact, when we got the car and found out it had a cracked lower bowl on the, crap, on the carburetor, Nick had to order our carburetor bowl from Australia where there's a guy there that makes them. 
And that's the only place you can get them. So he had the mohair seats done with proper original 1930 mohair. He had the interior completely redone by a master woodworker with hand tools only. He, he was a little fanatic about this. Uh, you know, the grating on the doors and the, the dash were done by hand on the steel. Everything in this is absolutely correct on this car. And it, it shows. This has won the 1997 Antique Automobile Club of America Senior National First Prize. Three years in a row, this won the Illinois Secretary of State's Automobile Show Best in Prize, or Best in Class and Best, best in Show. And the first year it went through, it's the first car to ever go through that show with a perfect score. They could find nothing to mark it down. Now, that was 29 years ago, but he maintained it well during this. This is the Type S that the Hubmobile Club of America uses on all their print and web literature for that type of car. It's one of three known surviving rumble seat roadsters from 31. One Par was in Paris, France in the 90s. The other was in California and this one. And it's won, I don't know how many awards and prizes. It, about every, it won about every car show it was going to in the 90s and into the early 2000s. One of the things I do want to point out also is take a look at this car. Then go take a look at our 31 Packard. This car, for a third the money, is pretty much the equal. Now, that's an eight-cylinder versus a six. But the quality, the layout, the driving lights, the horns, the double, the double spares with the mirrors on them, the rumble seat, the rumble seat steps, the trunk. Both these cars, put them side by side, this is shorter, but they're very similar and very similar in quality. And that's kind of amazing. Here's a few pictures, obviously that's it now, but some of the restoration pictures. It, six years, over 2,000 hours on this little car. Any questions? Can you have some more? Uh, I don't know if we got the key in it, do we, Doug? Yeah, I don't know if the battery Probably isn't. We can try. Yeah, the battery's disconnected on it right now. It does run, but we're... One of the hardest things to do right now with classic autos is find tires. Nick's been trying for over two years to buy new tires for our Model R, Ford. They aren't there. Anything pre-50s or 60s, I'm not sure where the brake line is, isn't out there because of COVID, supply chain, whatever we want to blame it on. These kind of tires don't make them enough money to produce them right now. They're making more money off the standard tires. So I can't wait to get to drive this one, but the tires are just crazed enough and old enough we don't want to risk tearing up the car or ourselves. But it does run and drive. Could you uh, explain the front lights? You got two headlights and two below, and then you got some park lights. A fender, fender illuminating lights, yeah, and then the, the, the big ones here are the main driving light, or main headlights. You got driving lights down below so that they illuminate lower and a little wider usually. Help you watch for a kid, a deer, or whatever run out in front of you. Is that kind of unusual to have four like that? No, when you look at the Packard and the Rolls and some of the other, again, this isn't a high end car. The S was the base model. But with the higher end cars, those are pretty standard. On the, pack, on the 31 Packard, the lower driving lights turn with the wheels. As you turn the steering wheel, they follow it. This doesn't, these are stationary. And on the 32 Packard, the driving lights are stationary too. How many colors did it come in? That I don't know. I really don't know. And I'm not, I'm not sure this was the original color of this car because when, when Richard got it, time up? No. Uh, when Richard got it, it was in a cream color that we were sure wasn't the original, but I don't know for sure what the original was on this one even. How much did it cost? Originally? 
This one was at $995. Versus the packet was 3200 3, yeah. That's a lot. So then what's the value now? It's in the 40 50 range, I'd say, Doug. <laughs> yeah, probably closer to 50 Yeah. yeah. Right now, the, the great old, old cars aren't bringing a lot unless it's something completely special. Because those that are really into them are are gone. And a, and a Model A Ford was comparable price, I think you said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. By this point, I think these were about $100 more, if I remember correctly, but I think the Ford came in at around eight ninety five, and this was nine ninety five for a similar. What happened to Bobby's company? It folded pretty quickly. He couldn't couldn't keep going. I think he went into making parts as well. I'm looking at the, at the windshield wiper. Mm -hmm. Is there just one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, on this one, just one. Did that window? Yeah, that window tilts, tilts out. And then one of the most unique features on this one, because you get a lot of them, the window, front window tilts out, the back window rolls down. And I've got a theory on that, and Doug and I disagree heavily on the, what that window was for. Doug says it's for ventilation. I said it's a wooden spoon window. Because when I'm the oldest of three boys, and when we were misbehaving in the back seat, mom could draw that wooden spoon, smack all three of us, and go right on. We'll, we'll let history decide which of us is right on that argument. I'm wondering about the fuel that goes into that Yes. They shipped parts and apparently fuel ahead. They didn't have an axle in J Japan, but everything else seemed to be pretty much where they needed it. And the other feature of that car and that trip that I really, I meant to mention, but really found unbelievable was they only used six tires on that entire trip. There's a reason these had double spares because you could barely go across town without busting a tire back then. But they weren't going. Oh no, no, no. On that trip around the world, it looked like it was open cockpit. Mm -hmm. that just a completely open cockpit car, without canopy or anything like that. It was Deuce Freeds in Canada. Um, yeah, that one. I don't. That one never even had. A, from the pictures I've seen, even I don't think it even had a. I, I didn't see a soft top on it at all, or anything that could come. No, no top at all. That had to be fun in Canada. <laughs> it was probably a reason that in 31 they came out with that heating system. <laughs> Clearly wives weren't involved in the strip. <laughs> All the cold start technology too was probably born from that. From that. Yeah. yeah. If you look at those early cars before windshields, people wore driving dusters and big heavy leather things for protection and goggles. and. Head coverings and stuff. They're walking through some desert. Oh, yeah. So. Uh, they, they put a lot of horse hide blanket when they go out. Yeah. And call, yeah. And they put the blanket on the hood. Uh -huh. You know, when they got there. Yeah. yeah. yeah it, it was a different time. It's exciting. <laughs> Back to the six tires. Uh -huh. Were they. Uh, a tube tire, or were they? I don't know. These tubes, tire? Doug. I think these are still tubes. They weren't solids. I know that. They they were either tube or tubeless, whatever. That's crazy. Yeah. Let's give Chris a hand.